Um, there's so much we could discuss on this topic today, but because it is after lunch, and because all of you have probably had quite a lot of carbs and quite a lot of sugar and feeling quite a little bit sleepy, I just wanted to start by asking you a couple of questions, if I can. So first of all, hands up in the room if you are a hybrid or flexible worker or any other definition that you would put in that group. Okay, hands down. Anyone who is not currently a hybrid or flexible worker? Ye few, ye happy few, thank you. You can tell us why perhaps a little bit later on in the conversation. Um, for those of you who are hybrid or flexible in some way, shape, or form, hands up if, it's, if you think it's made you more productive. This is a non-scientific self-evaluation. Interesting. And hands up now if you think it's made you less productive. Who's going to admit to it? I see a lot of abstentions around the room, so that, again, is a topic of great interest to us. Final question from me, then. Has it made you happier? Hands up if it's made you happier. And down, and hands up if it's made you unhappier. Again, a few abstentions in the room. Ah, okay, okay, thank you for being brave. Um, you know, these are interesting questions, all part of our emotional response to this great experiment that we are now in, which has been accelerated over the past years, but which, of course, has been going on for quite a long time. We have a number of things that we want to try to cover this afternoon, from whether flexible and hybrid working really helps labor mobility, whether it perhaps even entrenches inequality in a dual track system in our workforce. And I think that's a critical question when in CMI research, eight out of 10 managers say their organization has adopted some form of hybrid working, but seven in 10 managers find it harder to either onboard new team members or build relationships in a hybrid setting, right? So there are both benefits and challenges that come from the scenario we find ourselves in. I'm delighted to be joined today by three experts with great experience on this subject. Anna Lane, who's just made her entrance. Well done, Anna, who's president and CEO of Women in Business and Finance. So we've got you mic'd up now as well, which is great. Well, sort of mic'd up. It'll do. It'll do. Um, next to her is Sarah Kaiser, who's head of employee experience at Fidelity International. And Jackie Stevenson, who's chief growth officer for the EMEA at IPG. And I'll let you explain every single acronym in your job title in just a moment. But what we want to do to start off is have a few provocations from our colleagues on the panel. Um, they're going to talk for maybe three minutes or so each, and then I cut them off with a guillotine. Um, but first, I'd like to ask you as an audience to start composing your own thoughts, because we're going to be asking you to help us in a little while with two big questions. The first is whether you think the future of work is truly hybrid and inclusive. And second, really critically for all of us at CMI, what role do managers need to play in order to make that work? And there I'm thinking both upward, up the chain, and downward as well. Because all of us, as, as people who are interested in the future of management, have a big stake in the answer to that particular question. So do keep those in mind. But let me turn to my panelists first to kick us off. And Anna, because you made the first entrance, you get to have the first word as well. Can I come to you from a perspective from women in business and finance? Thank you very much. So we've got an interesting perspective, as you can imagine. So women in banking and finance, for those of you who don't know us, we are the uh, oldest um, gender and inclusion network in financial services. We've been going for about 42 years. We're volunteer led. And we became a social enterprise last year. And in fact, we were one of the fastest growing social enterprises in the UK last year. We ran some research with the London School of Economics, Dr. Grace Lorden, uh, called uh, 100 Diverse Voices. And it was all about asking people about the future of work. What came across very strongly is that everybody preferred the remote first model. And this was this study, and it's 100 Voices might not sound like a lot, but that's a very significant amount of qualitative research. That's 100 hours. We had front office, back office, different levels, 70% women, 30% men. And, you know, the, the presenteeism isn't productivity piece comes across very, very strongly, which, by the way, also men suffer from. It's not just a female point of view. So the overriding view from everybody is that they like the remote first model. If you're talking about inclusion, some of the uh, sectors of society that folks find themselves most excluded in the workplace and are most comfortable working majority remotely are uh, black women in finance, particularly uh, uh, senior black women in finance because of the amount of microaggressions they get. So I, I think what comes out of our work, and I'm very happy to share it with all of you, is that working remote first is great for people that either suffer from inclusion, they need flexibility, 
Um, you know, they, they want to be more productive working on their own. None of the managers told us that they actually saw a productivity gap emerging. But I think the other thing is this is all about, there are then challenges with that around trust, managing burnout, and of course, managers themselves have to manage that process. Anna, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure we'll have some questions later on about the research itself um, and about some of the points you've just made. Sarah, can I come to you next? Now, we, we were talking before um, about fidelity and, you know, you have a reputation which had reached my ears about being quite good at thinking about these issues and quite forward thinking as a company in the financial services sector. Perspective from yourselves. Sure. Fidelity has taken a really different approach to many of our peers and competitors around the future of work. We felt that during COVID, we learned we really could work in very different ways and be far more productive and effective than we'd ever expected. And we didn't want to lose that when the office could reopen and the world went back to normal. So I think I can hear a bit of feedback. It's this. It might be that, yeah. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So the approach we've introduced, we call dynamic working, and that reflects the fact that we think it's something that is going to keep on changing over time. The, you know, it's only a couple of years that we've really lived in a world where almost everybody is hybrid and it will continue to evolve. And it's based on being flexible about both where we work and when we work. What's unique about our approach is it's very trust based. We want to give our people the maximum possible flexibility they can have, depending on the needs of their individual role. What that means is everyone has been categorized as either an office worker, a remote worker, or a hybrid worker. And 90% of our people are hybrid workers. And for them, we have an expectation that they would come to the office somewhere between four and 12 days a month. And any other day, it's up to them where they work. We leave it to each individual team leader to set the norms for their area around how much people need to come to the office to collaborate. We also categorize people as whether they had to work defined hours or flexible hours, and 60% of people work flexible hours. Just a few things I'd like to draw out from our experience, um, and I'm sure we'll get more into it in the questions. One is that this isn't easy for everybody. What's really fascinating is having decided to treat everyone as grown-ups and be very trust-based and leave people to have grown-up conversations about individual requirements and team requirements. We did have some people say, please just tell me how much I need to come to the office. People do still like structures and guidance. and I think it's been helpful to share patterns. The second thought is that this isn't just a matter of policies. It's about setting the right systems, infrastructure, and other ways of working to support that. So we've done a lot of work with our managers, but we've also done a lot of work to try and make sure that we can um, still support people in the right ways with opportunities. Like we have a virtual talent marketplace where people can find mentors, job opportunities, and additional experience. The third thing that I just really wanted to highlight um, and we'll probably talk about this a bit more, is there are so many different potential impacts on inclusion, both positive and negative. For all of those, I would say it's about being aware of them and looking at how you can build on the opportunities and manage the risks. I don't think any of them are a reason to say yay or nay. What I can tell you though from our experience, being an asset manager that has gone for a very flexible trust-based approach when many of our competitors are insisting people come to the office three to five days a week, We've had a huge increase in applications to work for us, particularly from female applicants. We found that all our people really value that flexibility and it's supporting their work-life balance and their productivity. And we're certainly able to do as much as we did before. So that's been really positive. We haven't seen any differences in office attendance between men and women because we're very concerned about how it could affect people's access to networks and opportunities. But all that we've heard about the fact that women are more likely to attend the office less and it could harm their careers, so far is not appearing to be true for us. And um, there's lots more I'd like to get into, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. So I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Yeah, you'll, you'll have ample opportunity to come back on more of that later. I, I'm, I'm really feeling quite happy as well, Sarah, that you said that flexibility is becoming a talent attractor for you from other businesses, because that's something is anecdotally that I hear across a lot of sectors, not just financial services sector. Now, Jackie, from the perspective of someone who has both built and sold their own business, and as someone who is now 
sort of overseeing growth across a huge stable of firms uh, in the IPG umbrella. What, what do you see in those companies and what sort of patterns can you pick out given that there's so many different ways of operating within them? Yeah, well, we're, we're quite kind of matrixed in our, in our structure. So I, I sit at group level uh, into public group um, and I look after across EMEA um, all our agencies in terms of growth and strategy across media, advertising, digital tech. Um, but exactly uh, as, as you said, I, I sold my business um, to, to IPG. So um, I kind of know it from the bottom up and now I'm seeing it from the, uh, from, from the top down. I, I think... IPG has always been very focused as a group on attracting and keeping the best talent. And to really build on the point that was made, this is one of the levers that we have at an IPG level um, is flexible and hybrid working. Um, to get top talent, uh, whether that's junior, middle, C-suite talent, the world of work has changed so much post pandemic that talent are completely recreating and rethinking the way that they want to build work into their lives. So flexible and hybrid is, is something that's enormously important for us to build into any contract that we have or any negotiation we have to bring talent to IPG. I think the other thing from an IPG perspective is that um, we've always been focused right from our CEO back in kind of 2014 early, looking at how we can incentivize our businesses to bring senior female talent into the upper ranks of the C-suite management. Um, all of our bonuses now look at diversity of talent at C-suite level, um, particularly around women and diverse women. Um, and flexible and hybrid has been a huge tool that's enabled women to be able to keep these senior roles and not have to be present in the office and, and, and doing that in a way that they can curate. So these are tools that are very important to us. But whenever we look at this, we're always looking at it from a manager perspective and also an individual perspective. Perspective. And I think the two things I'd like to, to bring out really is the support we need to give managers to enable them to curate and craft the right ways of hybrid and flexible working policies and frameworks within each of our organisations. Um, we very much let our managers and our CEOs develop their own way of creating um, frameworks that work for their particular business. But if you've got a manager who is used to thinking very hierarchically about a team, um, hierarchies don't work as well when it's hybrid and flexible. Um, so you have to rethink the way that you want to structure that team. I think the other part is outcome-based. Um, it's very easy to say outcome-based management, but actually knowing what outcome-based management is and managing someone's productivity and outcome versus how many hours they clock in is, is an area that we kind of focus on a lot with, with IPG to help our managers. But I think the other thing I'd love to talk about as well is the employee responsibility, because I think there's so much more focus, particularly around mental health, on an employee when they are away from the office, they're working remotely um, to make sure they have the right environment for work, to make sure they're getting the right support. And I think the other thing is visibility. If you're not in an office or you're not out networking or you're not out talking and speaking to people, your visibility begins to decline quite quickly. So being able to think of strategies and helping our employees still be visible both in the workplace and outside for their broader careers is, is, is really important. So from an, a company level, it's a real talent attractor, but you need to think about frameworks for managers and you also need to give tools to employees because there's things that they're going to lack if they're primarily flexible and hybrid. It's interesting that you land there on this question of visibility because we were talking just before uh, the session this afternoon about a Sunday Times article, which was about bosses, I don't like that word bosses, actually, let's change it, leaders in organizations um, coming in and saying to their senior management teams, you actually are working from home too much, you need to be back in the office because actually quite a few of your junior staff are here and you are conspicuous by your absence. I wonder, uh, for, for all of you on the panel, what reaction you have to this, to this point. I have seen it in some of the workplaces that I am involved in, where I walk into the office on some days and I'm the only one with gray hair and the only one of a certain age in the room, and, and yet all of the younger staff are in, working very hard. Are they getting the right uh, visibility from managers? Are they getting the right input, the right support, et cetera, from managers in that situation where we seem to have gone off in two slightly different directions? And I wonder if you've seen this phenomenon. <laughs> what number have you got? Uh, 
Um, right, I haven't actually I've got yours now, but I've got this one too. I've got six and five. <laughs> Which one would you like me to talk to? Hello. Oh. There um, you go. Sorry, I didn't mean to be the comedy guest here. Yes, <laughs> um, I think this is super interesting. Actually, I was very, very struck by a point you were making too about networks. So must just say something quickly on that one. So one of the reasons that women don't progress is lack of external networks. It's very, very important. It's one of the reasons that WIBIF was formed, Women in Banking and Finance. And it was all about people, different individuals from different companies coming together. Because when it was formed about 42 years ago, um, it was a, a group of women who didn't see other people like them. And at that point in time, only 1% of the managers were men. So they got together and said, right, what can we do to sort of replicate these networks, the golf, the drinks, the strip clubs? One of my first interviews, would you believe it, I actually got taken to a strip club for a laugh. I mean, I didn't mind, but I wasn't sure. Anyway, um, so it's really important. So this presenteeism bit for, for, for anybody, but particularly the young people, particularly about networks is really important. You can create it in different ways. So not joining networks like ours, the CMI, are really, really important because A, they offer training, um, but also lots of sort of uh, meeting with people from who might do similar roles to you in different industries. That's super important. So I think you, everybody has to think about that, the LinkedIn profiles and everything. The piece about seniors in the office, I, I struck me too, and I guess I'm very torn on this one because I'm also an entrepreneur uh, um, and I've worked remotely. I've been working like this since 2007. I'm obviously very forward thinking. Um, and I'm, I've got a healthy distaste for people just being in the office for the sake of it. However, I'm working on a very big piece of Gen Z work at the moment. And one of the things in Gen Z are basically, they're going to be the, you know, some half of them are still in school, 14 to 24, whatever it is. They are a generation who had to go through school and or university remotely. They value networks in work. Now, of course, they can build networks. Any Gen Z in the audience here? Yeah. Well, look, of course you can build networks. You know, anybody who does gaming, they meet lots of their friends that way. But the reality is, is that we, you know, anybody who hasn't done the walk of shame, do you know what I mean when I say the walk of shame? You know what that means? If you haven't done that, we haven't lived. And and so there's a there's a whole thing. But equally, if if we were lawyers, I don't know if anybody's a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, but my sister's a lawyer. And there's a very, very prescient issue with the training of, of uh, legal associates mm -hmm. who would normally mirror on the job. And I, I think I can say this, we're all friends in here. So my team are very young uh, that I have in the office. We actually deliberately moved to um, High, uh, Borough High Street because it's just a much more fun environment. The challenge we have there in two days a week, some of the basic business skills, you know, answering the phone, answering emails, etiquette, they're not learning it because they're not listening to other people and it's a big challenge so I don't know about the, the the guys but I did see that one of the the banks basically said that all of their senior managers were on the golf course the whole time I think I can't remember it was JP Morgan and literally you know that wasn't going to was sort of cut it I live in Fulham and just down the, the road you've got some big golf clubs apparently it's full of civil service literally so all the retirees are fed up with the civil service i've been trying to get my tax return just saying for about four months my accountant said well they're not in the office yeah. so you know i don't know i do think you need learning but i also think that we've got to be much much more creative about virtual workplaces meta we need to think much more creatively about how we do stuff old practices doesn't work in the new world yeah so, so there's a clear tension here between some of the things that we value from the in-person workplace versus some of the practices that we may need to ad adopt for the future. Sarah, have you seen this problem? This uh, seniors are at home. They, you know, they're, they've got a either a big garden shed office or a lovely room to sit in. Plenty of room. You know, no, no issues at all. Younger workers in the office, or because you've been so deliberate in the creation of your offer in the firm, actually you found a way around that. Um. I wouldn't say we've done it perfectly, but we've seen something slightly different. Oh, I don't think this is working at all. Oh, oh hello. Okay. There you are. Two. <laughs> it's all right. We're all good. Um, we definitely haven't seen our senior leaders all on the golf course. I just want to be super clear. Yes. Um, what we have found, though, is that if a manager of a team doesn't come in, their team members are less likely to come in. And we have found some generational differences, but it's not our most senior leaders. It's more the mid-level. Um, and there is an inclusion issue here. If you're a younger person who perhaps maybe you don't have your own house where you've got a study 
Maybe you're sitting there working in your bedroom. Maybe you're in a shared house and you don't have a space you can work in. You're more likely to want to come to the office. We also found that maybe more senior leaders are more comfortable and used to the office, but it, it's that middle level, particularly the sort of working parents who are more likely to want to work from home. What we found is it's really important to be clear about what the purpose and value of the office is and to support people to come together. And we talk about the four C's. So we see the office as a great place for setting our culture and collaboration, for, com for coaching, and that's that development of sort of newest employees, for example, um, and for sometimes those challenging conversations you want to have face to face. And just as an example, in one of our areas, we say that when you're going through training, when you join us in our client services teams and our call center teams, for the first six weeks, there's an expectation that you'll be in the office three days a week for training. And after that, we can be more flexible. And of course, there's team leaders and managers around to support that. But it's about recognizing where you need to come in. And I always think with anything we're doing for employees, there's a give and a get. There's what you offer and there's the the responsibility that comes with it and we offer as much flexibility as possible but it is on that understanding that people need to do their bit they need to turn up they need to be an active part of our community so there's there's a bit of a contract here between the the employee on the one side their manager team leader and the culture of the business as a whole it's a tripartite contract mm -hmm. isn't it and do you think people start to, are starting to get that as a concept because I think those of us who study this stuff see it sometimes, and those of us who have spent our professional careers looking at this from a very theoretical lens, but do you think people are feeling that way? I definitely feel the buzz in the office on some days. I think it's when you come to the office with purpose and making that worth it equation happen that you get it. As you said, there's no point coming in just to sit at a desk and, mm. and type. But, um, oh, I'm getting in, I can see something saying, please use the handheld mics, mm. sorry. I'll just turn it back on again. You want it? You're next to the technical boat, you know that. Okay. Um, Is that better? Cool. Great. Sorry about that. And I've totally lost my train of thought. We were talking about, ah, uh, have we seen that difference? I think it's about the worth it equation. And when people genuinely do come in to collaborate for community, for events that bring them together, they see it's worth it and they will keep on coming in. And then they get all those added bonuses of the water cooler and the development and asking someone else. Um, if you're just asking people to come and put their bums on the seat for the sake of it, you won't solve it. And just to throw in a different perspective, we're a global organization. I don't know how many of you work from global organizations. And I think what one real benefit I have seen of more hybrid and flexible working is a democratization of people working in global teams where perhaps, yes, you might have been more easily able to access opportunities and networks if you're in the same office as someone. But now for those global colleagues, they can access the networks more easily without barriers and of course there are flip sides as well in global organizations i know quite a few people in global organizations who are now facing demands to be on calls with the far east at seven o'clock in the morning with the us at eight o'clock at night and the assumption is because they are flexible they can suddenly flex their family responsibilities and their day in order to accommodate all of that so we're still very much in the process of learning how to be global and flexible at the same time aren't we you're global and flexible as an organization as well. Are you seeing some of that same source of tension? Yeah, but very much so. I think just to um, to answer the point about managers, uh, one of the things that we say um, across our organizations is managers need to publish when they're going into the office. So they need to be really clear with their teams when they're going to be around because then teams can book in time with them. They can book them in meetings. Um, and what we're finding is that even though each of our agencies are curating their own ways of doing it, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays tend to be office days. Um, in our big buildings, we've consolidated quite a few of our agents in, into these bigger buildings, but we put on a free lunch every day. Um, and it's a really nice way of being able to get together over a social uh, conversation. We bring various different restaurants and vendors in to do it. So it begins to kind of mesh the teams into the community as well. So they've got local kind of um, uh, restaurants and, and, and vendors to be able to then go and see afterwards. So it's things like this that bring um, people together in, in the office.
practice. We're now beginning to publish best practice for things like when you're working on certain projects, on certain pitches, the kickoff meeting should always be in person. And then the manager who's leading that will always be in person. So if you want to be part of that and you want to have a voice, then you'll be in person. So I guess really it's an attraction strategy, but with some framework around it that from a from a, 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 a an IPG perspective, we can start beginning to kind of sow the seeds as to how this could work. Um, what was your your second question? Well, it, it was around this point of senior senior, senior managers and junior staff and uh, or middle managers and junior. Yeah, staff I think, and, and and also the um, that flexibility that you demand when you're in a global organisation. Yes. We haven't cracked this one yet. Um, this one's a work in progress because definitely um, flexible working has meant that the Middle East teams think that you can be on at seven o'clock in the morning and the American teams will want you to be on it, particularly if they're in LA. And my heart sinks when someone's calling me from LA that it's going to be 11 o'clock at night. Um, and that's something I think we need to start beginning to put guidelines in place because we're certainly finding that our senior leaders are really struggling to cope with how they say yes to some meetings things and, and, and no to others. Um, but again, it, it comes back to, I think, something that you said earlier, this is a work in progress. I think as we begin to lean into this more, there's more that comes up and we haven't got all the answers and we need to start thinking about how we're going to get those, but it shouldn't stop us moving forward with them. You, you raise an interesting question there around saying yes and no to things in this new world and this new environment. Maybe we can explore that as we open things out a little bit. What I'd like to do now, we have now spoken for half the session, far too much. Let's get the lights on, wake everybody up and get some questions in from the audience. I'd like to take groups of three, if I can, uh, direct them back at our panel. Um, and then come back as well to some of the things I was saying right at the, at the beginning. So I've got the, the gentleman just there, is the sand lady just here in the front. And did I have a third one? I thought I saw a third hand. Just here as well, please. Thank you. So we'll go one, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three, yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Question in particular for Anna in relation to financial services. I used to run, uh, I retired from running a, a, a national finance company last year. And we coped well with COVID and working from home and uh, did go to hybrid working. But my experience of phoning people uh, or phoning organizations over the last um, few months when I needed to change something or ask a question, um, I think there's been a degrading of service that is offered to people. And then that makes me worry about the kind of abuse that staff may feel when people are not getting the right answer at the right time so are we taking care of these business to consumer uh, 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 hybrid working situations where we're not quite geared up maybe to giving the right answer and finding that there is some stress coming into the system because uh, we can't supply the right answer thank you can you just tell us who you are as well before beg your pardon paul jennings thank you paul and to the colleagues just here in the middle is it on? Yeah, good. Hi there, my name is Janet Martin and I am an entrepreneur. I am currently with a venture capital firm working on their venture builder. They are a mission-based venture capital and our mission is around financial resilience. I'm specializing in earning more income and one of the barriers of earning more income is flexibility and inclusion and everything. So I've been doing some research and uh, this weekend found some really interesting research about side hustles. People having side hustles where it's one in three will have maybe creative or investing or property and one in two C-suite also have side hustles. So the research said by 2030, we should include people and um, encourage people to have their side hustles, also recognize them. And that adds to the inclusivity of the, um, the firm and also helps with staff re retention, makes people happier because they're working on something they're passionate about. And usually they, don't, they won't leave because the side hustle will only be about 20% of your income and you still need the security of your day-to-day -day job. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask the panel how they feel about that, okay. um, whether they think it can or can't work, and also if there's anything else they see as the future of flexible or inclusive work. That is a brilliant question, Thank and I, I love that you touched on financial resilience. In one of my other side hustles, I work on precisely this subject, so we'll have to catch up after this. And um, could, I, could I take the third question as well? Sorry, we're, we're just moving the microphone from one place to another. And just let us know who you are, please. 
Hi, I'm Olivia Hamill from Queen's University in Belfast, and I'm also the event lead for the Northern Ireland Regional Board for CMI. So basically, I'm in the middle of developing a hybrid working um, staff development course and really interested in the opinions of everybody about really looking at how do you build trust, particularly with staff members and managers and leaders who maybe aren't on board with hybrid working and also how do we manage the mental health of staff that maybe we don't see every day and do you have any frameworks or practical advice that you could offer thank you some big and very important questions as we navigate our way through this um and paul's question was was directed at you initially but i think perhaps everyone will have you on it this question about degradation of service there's two sides to that coin aren't there paul one is the frustration that the cli client or customer may feel about the degradation of service that they might see and the other is the member of staff and how they are treated uh you know particularly in a customer facing environment i think it's very interesting um i'm uh, i've been with first direct forever um i was one of the first ever customers i absolutely love them um first direct it takes them a long time to answer the phone um, I noticed for the first time they're not they're not number one bank. I think that outsourcing of call centers is very, very, very difficult. And um, you know, when we think about what works and what doesn't work, it's clear that doesn't work. It's not necessarily common sense says it's not necessarily that people are sitting at home. It's whatever the process is around that. Um, but it, it's it's difficult. At Women in Banking Finance, we have um, some very, very big retail banks. Um, who also deal sort of corporately. We have pensions companies. I know people are looking at this. They're looking at, you know, one of the questions around is around training, wholesale training, looking at this. But I think, you know, back to the points you both made, it is definitely a work in progress. I've noticed it in so many parts of my life. I actually dread phoning anybody. But the problem is, is that certainly if we think about finance, so much of the app-based uh, services, whether it's quite frankly B2B or whether it's uh, consumer, have not got a help run function, or if they do. So actually, that is a definite area where service is degenerated. I don't think the industry's got it right. For me, I don't think it is about people working remotely at home, fun enough. I actually think it's about re-engineering how you manage that whole process, looking at technology and data and everything, not to replace people, by the way, but for whatever reason, it, it doesn't work, and it does have a detrimental impact. And at a time when you have things like consumer duty, you have significant issues around trust. Um, and service and transparency, where you live in a subscription economy, speed, trust, make it easy for me, all that kind of stuff. Literally, business-wise, that is not the experience that we have in practically any aspect, particularly financial services. Mm. And what about the impact, just briefly before I pass on to colleagues, on employees in that scenario as well? Yeah, I think it's, I, I agree. I think the mental health issues are very significant because they will be getting abuse all the time because people are so fed up. Now, again, I know that all the big... Uh, companies do have programs where they train their staff to deal with it, they give them script to deal with it, mm -hmm. but the reality is it must be soul-destroying. And we all know that mental health uh, issues have increased since, since COVID. And one of the things that we found in our study, although we talked about remote first being the preferred method, we also highlight very clearly about how you have to protect the boundaries between work and home, how people have to be supported with all of that. So I, I know that, for example, Lloyd's do some, some great work in this space. Um, I think so do Aegon, um, but, they, but there are very specific training programs going on, but I still don't think it's there mm. um, because, because the reality is they're getting the abuse because they're just the ones picking up the call. Yeah. So it's the system that's broken. And that to me feels like it's an investment in platform and technology. Yeah. Could be wrong. No, I, I wonder, could I, could I come on to Sarah on this as well, just briefly? Um, because, again, you've got a consumer-facing part of your business, don't you, directly? And, Jackie, you'll have a, you'll have a lot of B2B questions around this as well. I want, I want to see if we, you can each tackle this one briefly, and then I'm going to move on to a couple of the other questions, if I can. Yeah, I've got, um, like I said, within our client services area, which is our call centre, there's a reason that we do want people to have that training in person first. Actually, during COVID, when everyone was working remotely, we kept customer NPS really high. We even had a few comments from our customers saying, why are you making your people come into the office still? Because they couldn't believe they were talking to people working remotely. I think it is very much how you train and support your people. But it's hard to do that without being able to just have someone there listening to a call, providing advice as someone's starting out. 
if I could touch on Olivia's question about mental health as well, is that okay? I will let you, you link it on? now. Yes, yeah, so I was yeah. gonna come back to it, but yeah, link it cool. now because it obviously goes hand in hand with what we're talking about. Yeah, it, it really does. And I think it's so important people have protections for mental health and against harassment in place for all their people. I, I don't think whether you're in person or virtual should make a difference to that. Um, when it comes to our managers, we've provided training on some tools we think are really important to leading a team who are working in a hybrid way. It's very much about focusing on output, productivity, being clear on what's happening, but we've also encouraged managers to focus more on empathy and inclusive leadership. And we do provide training for managers on mental well-being and how to recognize and support both their own well-being and that of their teams. More broadly, we've got a number of frameworks such as mental health first aiders, our employee assistance program. So there's always someone you could talk to, whether you're in the office or in remote. Um, I think that should always be the way. I guess I'd also just add that not having to commute every day can do wonders for people's mental health. Can do, except if the calls stretch, as we were talking about earlier, to to, to include the community. Shall I, shall I take side hustles? I was, I, that's exactly what I was going to come to. I, I said to myself, I, I, I want the person who's built a business and who's now overseeing all of these other ones, probably with a lot of chief executives who themselves have side hustles within those businesses. Can you take Janet's question on that? I like the way you phrased it. I think it's really important you phrased it as, these need to be recognized and valued by the businesses that employ someone. Um, I haven't heard it put quite that way before because we've talked about them being recognized as part of working life for individuals, but not for how businesses see it. How do businesses see it, Jackie? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a brilliant question. And I think it comes back to what we talked about kind of like at the top of the session around talent and talent retention. Um, you know, jo jobs for life, being in one job, doing the same thing for life, it just isn't a reality anymore. Um, and thank God for that. It sounds really dull. Um, if you want interesting, creative people at any level in your business, you have to recognize that their brains are going to be sparking on numbers of different things. So if you want to keep that talent, you have to help them do what they want to do. So again, side hustles are a really, really important part of this. It stretches the brain in different ways. It encourages different networks. It brings diverse thinking back into your organization. So, so we're all for it at, at, at IPG. Um, we really uh, try and encourage um, our teams to bring their thinking on their side hustles into the business and if there's any areas we can help them with that certainly in terms of technology and data and connections um, we do a lot um, with our um, HR teams looking at providing um, uh, much lower cost or free subscriptions to different apps um, or different um, uh, uh, media organizations so that uh, our teams can get access to that information I mean Blinkist is one of the ones that goes down really well you know if you're if you're in in certain number of our agencies you'll get a free subscription to Blinkist and you can begin to absorb all of this information about various different ways of thinking and different things that you're doing to be able to kind of build up your world of work but also build up your side hustles and we also encourage people to talk about it it shouldn't be a, a a private thing or a secret thing that you keep away um you know We'd love you to work for our IPG agencies and, and, and have a build, a build a really fulfilling career through them. But we're realistic to know that you're going to be with us for a certain period of time. So, you know, being able to kind of help you develop yourself is, is, is really, really important. And, and, and that key. a change a little bit. I mean, I, I remember as chief executive of an organization having to go and convince my board to let me do something on the side at one point in time. And it was definitely an uphill climb rather than one where was there was that openness and that appreciation. Do you think we've changed? And do you think that's been over the past couple of years? Or do you think it's actually been longer in coming in terms of recognition of the value that a side hustle can bring to the employing organization as well? I think I think it's I mean everything's accelerated post pandemic. Um, but I think there's the first recognition is you're not going to be able to lock talent in you have to keep talent by attraction. And if talent wants to do more than the one thing that they're doing, if you're measuring by outcome rather than presenteeism in the time that you're giving, then that's down to an in 
employee or someone that you're bringing into your team to show how valuable they are to the team. I think the second thing is a recognition that um, a broader platform and understanding of different types of businesses, entrepreneurial businesses, big businesses, um, is going to help the organization. So certainly in our contracts now, you can take, if you're a senior member of the team, you can take directorships in different organizations that's actually actively encouraged. Um, they monitor and manage the percentage of share that you can take. But again, that's just about being open and inclusive in everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, I think post-pandemic for us, that that's changed and it's all around the war for talent. I think we need to rewrite model contracts for senior managers as well in order to be able to enable that because too many of them still say, thou shalt not have Red line. outside <laughs> interests. Um, and that pr pr proves a turnoff. I think you're, you're nodding. It proves a turnoff to many people. Sarah, I want to come to Olivia's question uh, now, if I may, the other half of it, the one about trust, because you started your opening remarks by talking about a trust-based model at Fidelity. And I suppose, Olivia, part of what lies behind your question is how do you build that trust in the first place so that you can then deploy a lot of the processes and systems that you've used? Trust is one of our core values as an organization, um, alongside integrity. I think people often talk about earning trust. I don't really see it like that. I prefer to trust people until they give me a reason not to. Um, and actually, some of the best ways managers can build that trust with their teams is through doing some of the things we've talked about in the training earlier. So being really clear on what they want them to achieve and, and having those very coaching conversations about how to do that being open and authentic about who they are and role modeling the behaviors they want from their teams too. I would say there's a difference between hybrid and remote. And I think using those in-office opportunities, not just for meetings and workshops, but to really get to know people can make such a difference as well. Uh, but like I said, generally my, maybe I'm very naive, but I've, I've got a very trusting personality and people typically don't let you down when you put your trust in them. They want to keep it. I like the way you phrased that, though. You're turning the standard model on its head. The standard model is we don't trust anyone until they give us a reason to do so. And you're actually flipping it right around. And I think that's, that, that probably is an answer in a lot of settings, whether we're talking about the public, private, or indeed the third sector. Um, Anna, trust? Thank you. Interesting. I, I, I agree with you. I think the majority of people, you know, you can trust. I think there's a massive piece here about culture. Um, I, I love what you're saying about the, the side hustle. I'm an entrepreneur too, so I love anything like that. We had one person in our team that had this whole kind of, uh, you know, he was a, a VJ, DJ, did all sorts of Instagram stuff. Somebody else bases in a K-pop choir and she tours everywhere. We love it. And actually having, bringing that into business, having entrepreneurs is super important. The trust piece, let's think about it this way, right? So I think you're spot on. So at Fidelity, because they've maintained that very flexible model, they've had a dramatic increase in applications. You have to look at it. So I'm going to put my entrepreneur hat on and say, how sustainable, how competitive is financial services if they are stuck in the dark ages? If you're the <clears throat> CEO of Bumble and Bumble, why are you going to go to one of the investment banks in financial services to IPO your business when they think working flexibly and remotely is an anathema an awful lot of people in financial services are not allowed to sit on boards. You're not allowed to have uh, shares. It's like we, we've got the worst social mobility. We have the worst gender pay gap. And it is the investment banks, by and large, some asset managers, but not many, who are basically saying you have to be back in the office five days a week. Obsolete dinosaurs is what they'll become. Our industry will become unsustainable. So I think it's not just about trust. It's about recognizing this is the way the world is going. If somebody wants to be in the office five days a week, they should be allowed to. I don't even think that's a generational thing, quite frankly. Mm. I think that's to do with working style. But it comes across that financial services don't trust. And I had a, actually, I was here at the conference last year, and I heard this creepy tale that there are a bunch of companies that literally they can monitor the keyboards. So lots of people were saying that people set Teams meetings for nine o'clock on a, or 10 o'clock on a uh, Monday because they were all at yoga on Monday. It just, it actually appalled me that I was even listening to this stuff, mm. given what people have gone through over the past three years. It um, shows you just how poor management is. Don't, don't, don't you think, if you can't set, we're, we're going back yeah. and we've been talking about outcomes-based mm. mm. management. 
Uh, and then what you end up with is a surveillance culture rather than outcomes-based management for those people, don't you? Yeah, and the thing is that this is the, you know, the reality is you need all the bright minds at the table. Let's just, let's just, why do we care about this stuff? Obviously, we care about society. We care about people being happy because they're productive. But this is about being competitive and productive. That means all the bright minds at the table. Who cares how they get there and what they do with it so long as they're happy and productive and they feel nurtured and valued? Mm. Without it, we are not competitive, and particularly in my industry. I don't think it's so bad in others. You know exactly what I'm talking about, probably at Fidelity. Let, let's do this. We've got four minutes left. I want to check if there are any other burning questions in the audience that can be answered briefly. And then I want to come back to you, colleagues, as a whole. I'll take one question here in the middle and one just in the front. And I think, I think then we're done because we, we've got to make them very brief just because of the time we've got left. And the answer is very brief, colleagues, as well, if we can. Hi, um, I'm Deborah Turner, and I'm also the national lead for the Federation of Small Businesses oh. uh, for Women in Enterprise. So I run my own business. Uh, so really interested in the piece on entrepreneurship. But... What we found in terms of our members, we surveyed them uh, during the, just the first year after the lockdown, and 67% of them said, we don't want to return to uh, networking face-to-face. -face. We like the online networking. So that's what the FSB followed for some time, was that model. But actually, locally, where I'm, so I'm from the southeast, and our members were saying, please, can we just have face-to-face -face networking? Yeah. So I'd just re be really interested to know kind of whether or not you've seen that. And that although the hybrid working works very well for some entrepreneurs, but yeah. when it comes to building, nurturing those networks, they want to do that face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. So interested to hear. Great. Thank you. And we've got, we've got a second mic just here. And that's our last question. Perfect. Um, God, that's a bit loud. Um, so, so oh. Um, Sean Hitchcock, I work for Workall. Um, so we work with a lot of organisations on their employee experience. And on our B2B side, um, something we had a lot from our clients is um, a lot of reward and recognition. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you um, recognise and encourage uh, employee development in virtual workplaces and ensure that um, important development conversations that may happen casually in the office um, still happen in virtual environments outside of kind of quarterly or annual reviews? Gosh, that's a very big question with two minutes and 42 seconds left. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Deborah's question, if I can, with, with a slightly binary answer. Online versus face-to-face -face networking or both? It's actually not binary. That's three different options, isn't it? Uh, Anna? With a small business hat on, in person, absolutely, to hustle in person. Okay, Sarah? Both for a global business. I think. Uh, in person, um, because I think so much of the skills are developed there as well as the contacts. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd concur. You can, you can, with people you already know, where there's social capital already built up, virtual works fantastically. When you're meeting them for the first time, nothing beats face to face, does it? And now, uh, on Charles' question, which is much more complicated about recognition of development in the virtual world, Sarah, can I come to you first on that? Yeah, we've introduced the Talent Marketplace. It's a virtual platform where you upload your virtual CV, your skills, set out the skills and experience you want to build, and you can then be recommended mentors and opportunities. I don't mean jobs. I mean little gigs, side hustles, but internal ones, projects where you can build work experience. It's been a fantastic tool for helping people broaden their networks, find the right support for them to develop their careers. I like that phrase internal side hustle because sometimes we get jargon like talent marketplaces around them but actually that's what it is it needs to be recognized Jackie. um we we've brought our whole organization to do um assessments um and uh, uh reviews at the same time in the year and then we encourage our team leads to check in every three months before then. So there is a whole culture in our organization that July is assessment time. And that if you haven't already started putting those, um, uh, those, those check-ins in, you need to do that. So both team lead and employee know exactly what's happening when we're doing it. And it's in the culture. Right. And Anna, in 20 seconds or less. We've always get done awards, first ever gender network to do awards. Uh, we introduced some new awards actually um, uh, around mentoring because a lot of mentoring takes place virtually so people can get recognition of that. Volunteering because actually 20 million people in this country volunteer. That's a fantastic way to actually boost your career and it works virtually and also inclusive leader. So what I think what I'm not a, a person from a large company, an employee, but I think what you two are talking about to me sounds like being very inclusive leaders. So you can recognize that. 
Fantastic. And ladies and gentlemen, with 10 seconds left to go, uh, I want a view from yourselves. Uh, hybrid and flexible working for the title. Engine of inequality or mobility momentum. Uh, hands up if you think that this way of working gives us mobility momentum, please. There's the delay effect. That was peer pressure in the room. <laughs> and who thinks that controversially it might still be an engine of inequality in our workforce? Okay, a split decision. I think that reflects very much the discussion we've had, which is that this transition is still very much work in progress. And we all have quite a lot still to learn. I hope you agree with me that we have learned a huge amount from our three panelists today. And would you join me in thanking them all? Thank you, everyone.